Well, uh, Thanksgiving is a time for family, and we have been thinking about our identity as Christians. Who are we? And also, who are we as a church here at Pleasant Grove? What does it mean to be at Pleasant Grove? What does it mean to be a Methodist? So we are going to continue that series today. And as we think about family and we think about our family identity, I got to thinking about my own family. And we had pictures of all of our three children made. And we also compared those to Kelly and uh, my picture when we were baby. And I want to show those to you now. And uh, can you tell who is who? Which one of those is which? You know, there's Kelly, there's Gavin, there's Grace, there's Abigail, and uh, myself. Who is who? Well, let's see if you guessed correctly. On the left, we have Kelly as a baby. And then following that is Grace. And then coming next is myself. Top, top right corner is Gavin, and bottom is Abigail. So you can sort of see some of the similarities. And of course, you know, with different kids, uh, you never know what's going on at that one instant when the picture is snapped and they capture. But it just kind of spoke to me about how Grace has got that serious expression on her face, which really kind of matches her personality. And then I've got the serious expression. Uh, Abigail also has kind of a, a serious expression on her face, but she typically is more happy and easygoing and, and smiley. And then there, of course, Gavin and, and Ke Kelly as well. But uh, that's just a fun thing that we did in our family. Um, and it kind of, you know, the reason I put that there is because God really knows us when we're children. He's actively involved in our life even before we're aware that he is there. As a matter of fact, the scripture even tells us that God knows all about us even before we're born. And that's the, the theme of the message today. And it is what the scripture tells us that I want to read to you from Jeremiah chapter one, verses four through eight. It says, the Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. The Lord replied, don't say I'm too young, for you must go be wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. So in this passage, we hear that God knows us before we're even born. And I think about that because on our Christmas tree that we'll be putting up, very soon. We have a, a picture that we put on that Christmas tree every year. It's a picture of a sonogram that we had. Because after we had Gavin and then we had Grace and then Kelly was pregnant and we had a, a third child on the way, but it wasn't Abigail. It was a child that was never born. I think, I can't remember exactly Kelly, but it was six or seven, maybe eight weeks we, long. And then we went in for a doctor. We'd already heard the doctor's you know, we'd already heard the heartbeat and all of that. And then we went in for a checkup and we were so excited to be able to hear the heartbeat again. And there was no heartbeat. The, ba the baby had expired. And so um, that was a sad moment in our life. And we don't know why things happen the way they do, but we just trust God. And I'm so thankful because um, we were gonna have three kids and we wouldn't have Abigail if they had that other one because that would have been probably the end, but we were blessed to have Abigail. But we still know that I think, you know, we have the three kids that were born and raised, but then there's that fourth one. And one day, one day, I believe I'm gonna go on to uh, heaven and I'm gonna see that child that God knew that we never had a chance to know. And what a glorious reunion that will be one day when we meet that child that we never got to know. God is amazing and he has a plan and I don't understand how it all works, but he knows us before we are even born. And in this passage from Jeremiah, this is what is known as the call narrative of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet 
that God called to speak to the people of Jerusalem as the Babylonians were gathering around, encircling them, and were about to conquer Jerusalem and carry off of the, the Jerusalem people into captivity and destroy their city. Jeremiah had a very difficult task to try to minister to and speak the word of God to those people who probably didn't want to hear it. And apparently Jeremiah was very young because when he was called, he tried to make the excuse and say, you know, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. You know, anyone who's ever been called by God never really feels up to the task. There's something called imposter syndrome where you feel like you're an imposter. And oftentimes we will try to say to God, you have, you calling me, you, you must have the wrong person. You don't know me. You don't know that I'm not really equipped to this is. Moses said, I'm not a good speaker. Jeremiah said, I'm too young. Isn't it funny that we would talk to the man, to the God who created us. And we would say, I think you got the wrong guy. <laughs> I'm not made for this. And he says, I know what you're made for because I made you. I gave you the specific personality and gifts. I gave you your strengths. I gave you your weaknesses because that is what is needed for this task to which I have called you. God has called each and every one of us for a purpose. If we want to know what is our true identity, if we want to know who we are and why we are here, if we want to know the answer, the real answer, we should go to the one who made us. Amen. And so God calls Jeremiah and he says, I didn't pick the wrong person. I know who you are. I knew you before you even formed in your mother's womb. All Christian traditions believe that God made us and that we went astray, but that we are saved by God's grace. God saves us by his grace alone. And it's not because we are good people or we deserve it or we've done enough good things. It is by grace. I heard a, a funny joke this week. It said a priest was talking to a group of kids about being good and going to heaven. At the end of his talk, he asked, where do you want to go? And of course, they all said, heaven, heaven, we want to go to heaven. And then he said, what do you have to be in order to get there? And little Johnny said, dead. <laughs> of course, you got to be dead to go to heaven. But that wasn't the answer he was looking for. He wanted him to say, be good. The problem with the joke, though, is you cannot be good enough to go to heaven. But this is a popular myth that we have in society, even in a Christian society. You know, we have this image that there's you're going to die and you get to the cloudy steps of heaven and there's a gate, right? And there's an angel there and he's got a book and he's going to look up your name and he's going to say, all right, Joe Schmo, did Joe Schmo do enough good things in order to get into heaven? Or did Joe Schmo not do enough good things and he doesn't get into heaven, right? But that is not the way it is. That is not what scripture teaches. Scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. Therefore, none of us is worthy of entering into eternal life with God in heaven. No, all have fallen short and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, that is what atones for our sin. So that we are accepted, not because we deserve it, but because God is gracious. You are only saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. This is our Christian identity. This is who we are. But we are also Methodists here at Pleasant Grove. And one of the distinctive emphasis of Methodist tradition is our focus on, all, on God's grace. Now, all Christians believe and, and, and emphasize God's grace, but we are distinctive that we believe that not only does God's grace save you from heaven, but God's grace is actively involved in helping you throughout this life. You see, it's not just about what happens after we die. 
God wants us to live for him in this life too. And he also knows that we're not really capable of doing it on our own. We've shown that time and time again. And so in the Methodist tradition, we see this and we talk about how God's grace encompasses every part of life. Even before we're aware that God is helping us, he is helping us. God's grace is his undeserved, unearned, divine help. Jeremiah 1.5 reminds us that God's gracious help starts before we're even born. He says, I knew you before I formed you in, my, in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you for a special purpose. And this kind of grace that we talk about that happens long before we're even aware of it is called by Methodist prevenient grace. Prevenient grace is the grace of God that goes before us. It, it, it's there before we're even aware. Now, Abigail, I asked her a few weeks ago, I said, what is your earliest memory? She said, well, you know, my memories really started when we moved here to Dalton. We, she was about two and a half, three years old when we moved here. And so she remembers coming here and she remembers different things. You know how it is in your early memories. It's just snatches here and there. But she remembered her whole life memory starts when she came here to Dalton. But here's the thing. She was alive for two and a half to three years before we ever came here. There was a whole other church that loved her and blessed her, poured their life into her, pinched her cheek kissed her on the forehead. She was baptized at a different church. People babysat her at that church. And the th whole thing is, she has no memory of any of those people at all. Although they were great people who loved her. And that's a picture of God's prevenient grace. Before you even know it, he is pouring himself into you. It's the grace of God that goes before you even know it. And then, you know, after we moved here, um, from the time she was three years old until, you know, now her, her recognition of life is become, growing more and more. She's more conscious of it. But God was working all through those years as well to help bring her to the place where she is the person that she is today. And God does that for all of us. I want to show a picture. I mean, not a picture, a video. Would you say the full name of this time? Christopher Gavin. Christopher Garrett Mullis, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father, we baptize with water even now, baptize with thy Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. This day we commit this child into your care and keeping, Almighty God. And pray that as he grows in the knowledge and the love of Jesus Christ, his life will ever be kept in thy presence. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we pray. Amen. Son Gavin being baptized at East Cobb United Methodist Church by Jack Gillespie. Um, Kelly was, I think, 21, and I was 23 years old when that happened. You know, I told you last week that I didn't grow up in the Methodist church. I grew up going to Baptist churches. And so in, they're called Baptists for a reason, because they have a particular emphasis on the way they baptize. So my whole experience growing up was in the Baptist tradition. And I thought that that's the only way that... Christians baptized people. I was really taken aback when I came to a Methodist church and they baptized babies because we don't baptize, well, they didn't baptize babies in the Baptist church because sometime around the 1500s or the 1600s, Protestant Christians, a certain group of Protestant Christians said, well, that's not the way we're supposed to baptize. A person has to understand what's happening and a person has to believe in Jesus Christ before they are baptized. It's called believer's baptism. And so growing up in the Baptist church, I always thought that that's the way all Christians 
baptized people. And only those who did it infant baptism were some weird thing that was going on. What I learned, though, is that actually the majority of Christians throughout all time and throughout all the world have practiced infant baptism. That is the normal way of doing it. It is believer's baptism is the odd one out, actually. You see, here's the way history worked. The very first Christian, the first generation, the disciples, were probably baptized as adults because they were all the adults when Jesus came. The very next generation, though, they began baptizing infants because the disciples had children and they wanted their children to be part of the family of God in the church. And so they said, well, let's baptize these children from the very beginning. It was a baptism that emphasized the grace of God. In the Methodist church, we baptize infants because, first of all, we baptize out of obedience because Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey all my commands. So Jesus told us to do it. In some church traditions, baptism is much like communion. It is an ordinance that you follow because Jesus told you to do it and you obey. But we in the Methodist tradition, not just us, but some other traditions as well, we celebrate sacraments, not ordinances. It's not just us obeying what God did. Yes, we are obeying what Jesus told us to do, but it is a sacred moment when God is doing something. God is pouring out his prevenient grace upon the child because, and some people say, well, how can you baptize the baby? The baby doesn't know what's going on. So here's the thing. Whether you understand what's happening or not, God doesn't limit God. God can do whatever he wants, even if you don't understand. You know, I'm 48 years old now. I've been to seminary. I know all about baptism, but I can tell you this. I don't know everything about baptism. And thankfully, my baptism is not dependent upon my understanding at all. Because if it was, none of us could be baptized. None of us understand baptism fully. But it's not dependent upon our understanding. It's an act of grace that God gives. And what is grace? It is God's undeserved, unearned assistance. It is his grace. It's a gift. And you don't have to understand it. It doesn't, but God can still do it. And he does it. In infant baptism, we are recognizing that even though this child doesn't know anything about what's going on, God is still pouring his grace out on them. And he is helping them. He's assisting them. He is surrounding him, not only with his divine love, but also with the love of a, of a family that loved that child so much they want to start it from the very beginning, following Jesus Christ. And not only the parents, but it's a whole church of people who are going to love that child and nurture that child so that it has every absolute best chance to grow up in the faith as possible. Now, some people will say, well, you know, they'll come to me often. They'll say, well, pastor, you know, I was christened as a child, but now I'm an adult and I want to be baptized. I want to say, no, 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 you missed it. You were baptized as an infant. I said, no, I was christened. Do you know what christening is? Christening is the moment in the baptism service where, like Jack, Pastor Jack said, what is the name of this child? And I said, Christopher Gavin Mullis. That is christening. It's when you give the child its Christian name. If you put water on the child's head, you have baptized it. And so if you've been baptized as an infant, you have been baptized. And it... It's good. God did what he was going to do in baptism. And you say, well, well, now I'm an adult and I understand it better. I want to be baptized again. It's like, why? God has already done it. Do you not think he did it right the first time? <laughs> Are you going to say to the creator of the universe, um, you didn't do it right the first time because I was a baby. Now you can do it right because I'm an adult. No, God has already done it. And he knows what he's doing. I trust that. 
So if you've been baptized as a baby, you've been baptized. Now, baptism as when you're an infant doesn't complete until the moment when you come to the age of recognition and you choose for yourself to confirm your faith and say, well, now this is something I'm choosing for myself. I believe in Jesus Christ and I want to follow him and I want to be a Christian. And then at that moment, your baptism is complete. The goal should be that our children always grow up surrounded by and knowing the loving presence of God. I often will hear sometimes from people, you know, I never remember a time when I wasn't a Christian, when I didn't know God. Sometimes, you know, we hear those dramatic testimonies and they're dramatic because somebody lived 40 years of their life and they were going in all the wrong directions. They were doing terrible things. And then somewhere along the play, God got a hold of them and shook them and changed their life. And they converted to Christ and they began to live for Jesus. And we all praise God and we thank God for saving that wretched sinner. It's a wonderful, dramatic testimony. But is that what you want for your kids? It's not what I want for mine. I don't, wanna, I don't want my children to spend 40 years of their life living as a scoundrel and then being dramatically saved by Jesus Christ. No, I want my children to start from the very beginning with having everything possible to help them walk the Christian faith. And so that's nothing to apologize for. If you look back on your life and you say, well, God's always been there. I've always felt like he was there. You know, and maybe at some point, you made a decision or you reconfirmed your decision that you were going to continue to walk in the light. That's what I want for all of us. And that's nothing to apologize for. That should be the goal. But from time to time in the Methodist church, we may have moments when we are asked to remember your baptism. Remember your baptism. For some, that's a challenge. We have moments when we are asked to remember and we think, well, we can't remember because we were infants when we were baptized. And who can remember what happened to them when they were a baby? Unless maybe you saw a picture or a video of it. But that only reinforces the whole point. Aren't you so thankful for your parents who brought you to church and had you baptized as an infant? before you even knew what was going on? Aren't you so thankful that you have been surrounded by a, a loving family here at the church to help you grow up in the faith and you can't even remember all of the wonderful things that people have done for you? That's a blessing. And so for many in the Methodist church, when we are instructed, remember your baptism, we can't remember the ceremony, but we can remember and be thankful for our parents and the other people in our life who lifted us up before God. We can remember them and we can be thankful and we can remember God loved us before we even knew him, before we were even formed in our mother's womb. And we can be thankful for the love of God that drew us toward him throughout our lives. For some people, that was through a childhood where we had all of the advantages that we needed to help us grow up to a time when we could confirm our faith. Other people did not necessarily have the best circumstances. Maybe you grew up in a broken home or you suffered some traumas or some abuses while you were a child. Maybe that made it hard for you, but still God was there working on your behalf. And I think that those who have had a harder life, maybe God had to work extra hard to intercede on their behalf, to help them to come to a place where they could see all along the way. And they had no one else that was rooting for them. God was rooting for them. Other people may have had a really blessed childhood, but you know what? It doesn't matter. Everybody makes their own choices. Some people have the perfect childhood. They still make the wrong choices in life and they turn away. But God never gives up, even on those. 
He continues through His pervenient grace to call people back. And we can be thankful for the love of God that draws us to Him. Perhaps the pervenient grace of God is drawing some of you to Him today. Have you ever been baptized? Were you baptized as an infant? Were you baptized as an adult? If you've never been baptized at all, and I hope you'll talk with me because I would love to be, have a chance to baptize you. We have a ceremony that we use sometimes in the Methodist church called a remembrance of baptism. It's found on page 50 in your hymnal. And we're going to use that today as we remember our baptisms. For those who are Christians already and who have been baptized, this is a chance for us to remember who we are as God's people, what we are called to do. But if you've never become a Christian, you've never been baptized or become a Christian, these same words can be the words that you use today to make a choice to be a Christian to accept Jesus as your Lord, to be saved and to know that you have eternal life and to begin from this day forward to walk in the faith. So join me on page 50 in your hymnal as we remember our baptisms together. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ, Holy Church. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, Reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sins. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages nations, and races. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them through the, to freedom through the Red Sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. 
He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit and by the gift of water, that by this gift of water, call to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our baptism. For you have washed away our sins. You clothed us with righteousness throughout our lives, that dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. Remember your baptism and be thankful. The Holy Spirit work within you that having been born uh, through water and the Spirit, you may live as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Let us rejoice in the faithfulness of our covenant God. We give thanks for all that God has already given us as members of the body of Christ and as a congregation of the United Methodist Church. We will faithfully participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service and our witness. Mm -hmm.